Welcome. The Thames River Heritage Park Foundation is pleased to present another of our virtual Stories from the Park, The President's Desk, The Story of the Resolute. I'm Amy Perry, Executive Director of the Foundation, and I want to thank you for joining us. The Thames River Heritage Park Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to promote, support, and sustain the Thames River Heritage Park, a collection of heritage sites linked by water which capture the history and culture of life along the Thames. In collaboration with more than 20 institutional and heritage partners, we fulfill our mission through educational and historic boat and walking tours, through our popular hop on hop off water taxi, which ferries passengers to sites in the park, self-guided audio tours, as well as events like this. A gift from Queen Victoria to President Rutherford B. Hayes in 1880, this famous piece of furniture has a fascinating story. From Kennedy to Reagan to Obama and now Biden, the Resolute Desk has an icon is an iconic fixture in the Oval Office. We're going to hear about its origin, about the perils of Arctic exploration during the mid 19th century and the connection the desk has to New London. It's my pleasure to introduce our lecturer, Steve Manuel. Steve is the executive director of the New London County Historical Society. His interest in maritime history began while serving in the US Navy aboard the US Constitution. After 10 years in the Navy, he worked in the special collections and archives at the W.E.B. Du Bois Library and assisted the archivist at the Spencer Abbey. He continued to work in the museum field, including curating the Seward Natural History Collection at Connecticut's Old State House and creating digital programming for three outdoor trails at the Old Sturbridge Village. He has organized the New London County Historical Society Collection and speaks on various topics, including Benedict Arnold, the history of the, sandwich, of the submarine sandwich and the privateer Putnam. Steve holds a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Biology and a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of Massachusetts, as well as a Master's in World History from Northeastern University and a certification in public history. At the end of Steve's talk, he'll be taking questions from the audience through the chat feature. So please feel free to enter your questions at any time. We hope you enjoy the story of the Resolute. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Steve. Thanks so much. Uh, Amy threw me a little bit. I forgot I spoke about submarine sandwiches. We're not about talking about that today. Um, I'm going to go right into it. Uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you attending this talk. I hope you find it interesting. Um, as Amy said, the uh, gift of the Resolute Desk came from Victoria to the President of the United States in 1880, it was Rutherford B. Hayes. At the time, they didn't know they were going to get it. This box just showed up and they opened it up, okay? Um, and here's a picture of uh, President Biden and his dogs by the desk. Um, every time I see it, I hope the dogs don't scratch the desk, but I'm glad to see the dogs in the Oval Office and back in the White House. Um, hold on a minute. There we go. This is the plaque of the Resolute. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but you can see um, this was the only clue that they had that uh, the ship came from Victoria. And she talks about why they gave it to us. Um, it talks about uh, Captain Buddington and the George Henry finding Resolute, the United States buying her and fitting her out and sending it back in goodwill and friendship. She sent these da this desk back in the same spirit. So I wanna talk a little bit more about that, but you can see that. I'm going to give people a minute to read that um, if they want. So it all begins um, with the Northwest Passage. So what is the Northwest Passage? The Northwest Passage is a navigable passage from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And the search for this started um, in the 1600s. England had a vested interest in learning this. The only way they could get to Asia was either by sailing around um, Africa or sailing around South America. Um, I've been through uh, the horn, been around the horn. Um, it's a very difficult passage. I was in an aircraft carrier, 14 degrees it turned us. So I can't even imagine what it was like sailing on board one of these wooden vessels. 
So it began on um, the earliest record was uh, John Cabot in 1497, Henry VII tasked him to search for it. He tried going in from Asia. He thought he could go in from Asia and he explored all around, but it became impossible to pass through. So he had to turn around and sail back. The next man to really make an effort in here was a man named Martin Frobisher. He was a Seahawk. Seahawks were privateers that worked for Elizabeth II. He made it the furthest in at the time. This was in the 1500s, but he too had to turn around and go back to England. Um, so they were looking for it. And what happened and what started it all was the age of exploration and age of discovery. Um, Spain, Portugal, England, the Netherlands began exploring the world, France began, began exploring the world in the 15th century. They, it was a race for kind of discovery. It was uh, among all of these nationalistic calls to be uh, great nations in the world. Um, the United States actually joined this effort, but they didn't do it until the age of imperialism when these countries were colonizing everywhere. The United States sent out the exploring expedition in 1838, and with that expedition, um, they threw their hat into the ring of this, the, this age of discovery, this idea of learning things and being a great nation. So in 1838, the United States actually officially discovered and actually got to Antarctica, uh, which is really exciting. Um, that was the Wilkes expedition, the exploring expedition. Um, there's a lot to that. There's even some ties to Stonington in that lecture. Um, but this was now the North, Northwest Passage, right? And they had to explore the Arctic. And this was a really daunting task. I wanna really kind of set it up what they were going through and what they were doing in these wooden ships. It required an immense fortitude, immense amount of labor in order to just navigate this area and explore this area. Um, the ships had to be specially outfitted. Their sides were thickened, their um, hulls were reinforced. They had steam engines put in. They would put steam pipes through all the cabins to warm them because without them, when they tried without this, um, sailors would talk about sleeping in their cabins and their breath would cause condensation, which would freeze on the walls. They would talk about their blankets, which were frozen around their feet, but warm and wet around their torso because it was warm enough to melt that ice. Um, food was important. You had that typical food that you normally get uh, when you're at sea, dry rations and stuff like that, but scurvy was really significant in the cold and you needed foods that you could eat to stave off scurvy. You needed that vitamin C. Potatoes were a big staple. Um, charts, charts were also important. Um, they would have to chart these areas, but they really needed to know where the ice ended and the land began because often they would set up bases and they would need dry land because they couldn't set up bases on ice because it was capricious, all right? Because the ice would break up and they really had to pay attention when the ice broke up because there were only times when you can navigate through here when that ice was broken up, when the pack broke and became the flow. A flow is the moving ice. The solid ice is called the pack. So as I talk about it, you'll know what I'm talking about. They would bring um, boards, extra boards, but they would have to put a home base and they would get supplies from that home base. And they'd have to navigate the flow and they can only do this during June and July and somewhat August, really more main June, July is when the pack broke up and they had to navigate through the flow. Um, they would carry extra lumber because inevitably they'd be frozen into the pack and they would winter over and they would put houses over the spar deck in order to have more spaces to store things and to keep things out of the cold. The spar deck is the top deck of the ship, is the spar deck. So in addition, while they were navigating in the water, they had all these techniques that they would use. They would warp often. All the ships would be outfitted with screw propellers, which would propel the ships, but they still had that flow problem. They have, would either have to steer around this ice that was always coming at them, 
or they could get becalmed and the, and the um, screws wouldn't work. So they would warp, which is they would use ice anchors and they would attach it to ice or land and literally use the capstan that they used to raise and lower the anchor or raise and lower the sails. And they would literally pull the ship along. Often what they would do is they would attach themselves to an iceberg. So as an iceberg was passing and it was caught in a current, they would attach ice anchors to it. And then they would sail in the black water wake of the iceberg and the iceberg would deflect the flow ice as it was coming at the ship. And the ship could be behind the iceberg and safe from all that ice hitting into the hull. And then eventually when they got trapped into the pack ice, they would use these big sledges um, and they would have to pull them by hand and they would pack their supplies on them or if they needed supplies, they would sledge across the pack to wherever their home base was or their supply ship was. They would pack their sledges and they would drag them back to the exploring vessels. These were done by men. They didn't have dogs at the time. If you can imagine in, in extreme temperature, extreme cold pulling these sledges for eight to 10 hours a day. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about sledging um, later on. So England continually sought the Northwest Passage. And in the, in the final days of Ingles, England's second secretary to the Admiralty, that's Sir John Barrow, you see his picture there, Throughout his 90 year tour term, he was really trying, excuse me, 90, that's a very long time, excuse me, it's like 84 years. Through his 84 year term, he really tried to find the expedition, uh, excuse me, find the Northwest Passage. He was due to retire and he decided he was gonna put forth one last significant effort. And he tasked that effort to Sir John Franklin. So in 1845 was the year he retires and he decides he's going to send out Franklin and he gives the commands that Franklin do this. Now, Franklin was born in Lincolnshire, England. He was the ninth son of a minister. He, his father wanted him to be a minister. He ran away to sea when he was 12. Um, he started working with the East India Company. Eventually he joined the Royal Navy. He was a veteran of the War of 1812, but he was also an engineer and a cartographer. A lot of, as you'll see, the majority of the captains on these expeditions were cartographers um, and explorers. So they knew how to map, they knew how to draw maps, and it was really imperative for this kind of thing so it can help with navigation. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So Franklin, this would be Franklin's third foray to find the Northwest Passage. He'd gone out in 1819 and tried and got back in 1822. He did another in 1825 to 1827. And then finally on May 19th in 1845, Franklin set out to find the passage he sailed. And he brought with him two ships, the Erebus and the Terror, the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror. These were bombardier ships from the War of 1812. Um, those people from Stonington or Botany area, they'll know the Terror was uh, one of the ships that actually bombarded Stonington during that battle and during the War of 1812. But they had been refitted along the lines that I was describing. Their sides were thickened. They were given steam, um, they were given steam engines and they were given screws, they were given propellers for underneath and they had piping run through the entire ship to heat cabins. So they left and they went to the Northwest Passage. So you'll see the roots on this picture here um, in the small one in green near the bottom left hand is his first, Franklin's first expedition. You'll see he tried very south both times um, 1819 to 1822, you'll see he went there. And then again in 1825 to 1827, this time he decided he was gonna go north. So when Franklin was aboard the Erebus himself and he sailed in, he went past Baffin Bay and he explored the area near Devon Island and around Beachy Island. And eventually what happens is um, they set up a supply base 
off the coast of Baffin Island. And Franklin went in and he was there. And in 19, in September 46, the Erebus became frozen in the pack. Okay, so she was stuck in the pack ice. So she wasn't going anywhere. In September, they expected this. In 1847, Sir John Franklin dies. And when he died, the crew decided that they didn't want to continue on. So they decided to abandon the Erebus and walk back to their supply base on Baffin Island. Um, neither the Erebus or the Terror was heard from again after this happened, after they abandoned the ship. So, when Franklin fails to return, his wife, Lady Jane Franklin, becomes very concerned. The Admiralty, who had sent out the expedition, Franklin was only gone for a couple of years. They weren't really that concerned, but she continued to ask them to look for her husband. So they relented in a way. They decided we're gonna send forth a search effort for the Franklin expedition. And what they decided to do is to, um, two sailing searches. So they sent out two ships to search for Franklin. They also tried an overland search, but this didn't yield anything. They didn't find anything. So what the king did uh, was he offered a reward of 10,000 pounds for anybody who had any information on the Franklin expedition. And he offered 20,000 pounds for anybody who actually cited the expedition and helped them in it. Nobody found them. Nobody got this money. Lady Franklin continued to write. She wrote everybody, and it became this international effort. She wrote everyone in the world. She wrote um, President Taylor, Zachary Taylor, and he responded in kind by um, getting uh, Henry Grinnell to outfit not one but two expeditions to search for Franklin. Now, Grinnell was a, um, a merchant. Um, Henry Grinnell, let me do this. Henry Grinnell was born in, excuse me, born in 1799 in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, he went to Bedford Academy. He moved to New York, where he became a clerk for the H and D and E B C Well Commission, um, yeah, Commission House. In 1825, he began a firm which preserved fish. That's what he did. But then eventually, he opens up uh, a mercantile house, and he's joined by a man named Robert Brown Minturn, and uh, his company became the Grinnell and Minturn and Company. And they were in one of the most successful mercantile houses in New York, and they had an extensive dealing with the British. So it's likely Lady Jane Franklin knew Henry Grinnell, but the British absolutely knew it, Henry Grinnell. And he had the money to out the money in the ships and the wherewithal to actually do this exploration. So he got underway, but that kind of failed as well. So they decide that there's going to be one more significant, well, actually, that's not true. The Admiralty decides they're going to do another concerted large effort to find the Franklin expedition. And what they decide to do is they decide to outfit the Belcher expedition. This mission was designed to find Franklin in the Northwest Passage. Now, Henry Belcher or Sir, um, excuse me, not Henry, Sir Admiral chose Sir Edward Belcher to command this flotilla of five ships. He was born in Halifax. He was uh, in the war in 1812 where he jo joined the, um, the Royal Navy. He was a cartographer. He's had some exploring experience. He had an Antarctic expedition under his belt and kind of an Arctic expedition, but the two are very different. He only went to the Antarctic once. Belcher was excited about this expedition only in that it was going to advance his career. He actually wrote that exploring the Arctic would be very tedious. Um, and he was really not interested in doing this, but he did it because he thought he could become an admiral when he did this. He chose the HMS assistance, an ice cutter for his own ship. Um, his each, he would have two um, ice cutters and he would have two supports. Uh, there would be steamships, so the assistance in the Pioneer, 
the Pioneer was a steamship, a steamship support ship would carry supplies from the um, either the, the home base or the supply ship to the sledges. It was a smaller ship that could navigate much easier. This was a steamship. It didn't work like the um, big exploring ships. So then he got the North Star. The North Star was another bombardier ship like the um, Terra Nierbus. She was outfitted. She was to be stationed off of Beachy Island as their supply ship. So if supplies came to England, they'd be stored on North Star. Those supplies would be sent out to the exploring vessels via the supply ships or the sledges. So there's a lot of things going on here in order to support this effort. And finally, that brings us to the HMS Resolute. The other ship um, that was tasked with exploring was the Resolute and her support, her support ship was the HMS Intrepid. The Resolute was the um, Ptarmigan initially, and the Ptarmigan was re refit in the manner that I talked about before. Steam engines were put on her, her sides were reinforced. Um, there was, you can see here, there's a tent over the spar deck. Um, and she was sent out to uh, be part of this flotilla. And the Resolute was put in the command of a man named Sir Henry Kellett. Now, when Belcher was given command of this mission, he said, I don't want any of the captains serving under me. All of these ships had captains, including um, the ship that he was on, including the assistants. He didn't want any of these captains to have any more Arctic exploring experience than he did. And he knew why, because they would challenge his authority. Well, the Admiralty ignored him. They appointed Sir Henry Kellett to Resolute and Henry Kellett um, going in looking for the Franklin expedition this would be his third Arctic exploration. This would be his third Arctic mission. He knew how it worked. He'd been here before. He was from um, Tipperary, Ireland. He joined the Royal Navy in 1822, like Belcher. Um, he served aboard survey ships. He liked Belcher and Franklin. He was a cartographer. He was an engineer. He was a Navy officer. He was used to commands. Um, but unlike Belcher, Kellett had experience. And when the mission was underway and when choices were being made, this set up for a very contentious relationship between the two. At the end of all of this, Kellett was a Navy officer and knew how to take orders, but he did disagree with Belcher throughout the mission. And the, um, they did contend with each other. So, Here's that map again, but I put a little ship on it for you. In 1852, the Belcher expedition left seeking Franklin. In August of that year, um, they made it through the Davis Strait and passed um, Baffin Island. You see the big Baffin Island, they navigated all the way through. Um, Kellett would, would search north, Belcher would search south. Kellett made it all the way into a small island called Dealey Island off of the coast of Melville Island. And that was September. And here we are, it's September. The navigation of that area has become very difficult. And Resolute is frozen in the pack. She's there. That's it. So, but Kellett's not giving up. Okay. Kellett decides he's not going to give up. He's going to send out sledging them. So he's got sledges going across the pack to North Star. He's got sledges going to Intrepid. He's got sledges, um, and, and, and again, and assistance is doing the same thing. They've got sledges going to North Star. So if Kellett wants to talk to Belcher, he'll send the, that communication on those sledges. But even further, he sent his sledge teams out all over Melville Island looking for any sign of the Franklin expedition. And some of these sledge teams were out for three months. It became this point of pride between the mariners. They wanted to see who could stay out the longest. Three months was the record. They literally subsisted and existed out there. And they did this a number of ways. They would trade with the natives. Dutch, the, the Dutch had trading posts out there. Um, as they were coming in off Baffin Island or in, in Greenland, they would stop and pick up supplies. They would trade with the Inuits for fresh meat. They would often hire Inuit hunters to go with them to provide fresh meat and fresh food and to help them survive. 
So they would do a lot of trading and bartering. So they continued to look and it was to like no avail, okay? So Belcher becomes seriously concerned with what's happening here. The ice isn't melting, okay? The next year, the ice didn't melt, all right? Resolute stays frozen in the pack for three years. And Belcher, who really wasn't interested in even doing this mission, was looking for, at this time, any excuse to abandon it and go home. So he gathered his captains together and he said, I think we should go home because I don't think the ice is going to break up. Kellett disagreed. He disagreed forcefully, actually. Um, he felt that the pack was going to break up finally that year. He finally, it was going to break up. It was going to happen. Excuse me. So, and all the other captains of the ships agreed with him that we need to continue. We're doing fine. This is great. We're, we're, we're okay. Belcher overrode all of them. And he said, no, he committed his orders to paper and he sent them by a sledge to all the ships. They were to abandon their ships. And now we're looking at a piece that I actually got because I went up to the Royal Archives and got the, um, the journal, the ship's journal from the HMS Resolute. But you'll see this is Monday, 5 December, all right, in 1853. This is the last entry that um, Kellett makes, okay? Because he got his orders in May of 1853. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, in August of 1853. I want to make sure you get this right. August of 1853, and Kellett didn't want to go, like I said. He continued to journal each day, and December was the last time he decided not to start the new journal. Okay. Um, and he organizes all of his groups. Everybody um, decides, and this happens in May. They have all the stores on board, so they have one big meal, because why not? Um, there was, well, I'll talk about this in a little bit. Each man was given 45 pounds. That's all you get, 45 pounds of everything you brought for a mission you knew was going to last three or four years. You were only getting 45 pounds. They got 45 pounds. They loaded them on the sledges. And on May 15th, Kellett commanded his people to leave Resolute. All right. He didn't make any other entry in his journal after December. And off they went on May 15th, 1854. They sledged back. They got onto their ships and they went home. Okay. And unfortunately for um, uh, Belcher, um, Kellett was right. And here it is right now. Ships being abandoned. I didn't turn the slide in time. So here's a picture of Resolute um, frozen in the pan ice. It was done by an officer on the pack ice. It was done by an officer on board the ship. This is in our collection, this, this painting. It's a watercolor. And you'll see people just looking at the ship and, and gathering things up and taking them off. So Kellett was right. Okay. Um, Winter, was, um, spring happened, and Resolute does indeed break away from the pack. Okay, um, they had navigation at the time, but it was too late. They had abandoned her, and Kellett didn't even know he was right, um, and he wouldn't know till later on. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the people who found the Resolute and and what's going on here. And I got to begin with the Perkins and Smith firm. The Perkins family is descended from the Shaws, who uh, own the mansion that I'm sitting in right now. Um, Elias Perkins II, Nathaniel Shaw Perkins Jr., they call him Shaw, and Franklin Smith got together and they formed the, Frank, uh, the Perkins and Smith whaling firm in 1842. Elias and Nathaniel Shaw Perkins Jr. were both from prominent in London family. They both went to Yale. They had many business dealings here, and their family earned their money, the majority of their money, on the maritime trade, okay? They dealt in everything, rum, you name it, the Perkins um, and the um, Shaws dealt in it. 
Franklin Smith was a whaling captain. Um, you'll see, I've got a picture in the corner of Franklin Smith of Florida. Flora, you'll see Flora over the corner. Flora is the figurehead from um, the whale ship Flora and Frank Smith actually was the captain of the whale ship Flora. Um, all of these men were from New London. Uh, Frank Smith also was an affluent businessman. He owned property in addition to his whaling um, uh, income. He owned property inside and out of the city. When he retired as a whale ship captain, he decided to go into business with Elias and Nathaniel, with, with Elias and Shaw, and they formed the firm. When they were all, when all was said and done, these men had 24 whaling ships. And among those whaling ships was the George Henry. And here's the picture of the George Henry and the man who captained George Henry for the Perkins and Smith whaling firm. That man was Captain James Buddington. Captain James Buddington was born in Groton, Connecticut in 1817. And he ran away from the farm to the sea. So he's farming in Groton and he decided he wanted to go to sea. And then he decided he didn't want to go to sea anymore and he went to farming again. So Buddington spent his life farming or whaling and farming and whaling. And he was mostly in Connecticut, but at one point in time, he moved to Illinois where he got married and started a farm. So after his first set of whaling voyages, he started a homestead in Illinois with his wife. He missed whaling, decided to divorce his wife and leave the farm, he divorced his life, wife, left the farm, came back to New London area, came back to Groton, he lived in Groton, he dies in Groton. But he gets employed by the Perkins and Smith firm to um, captain whale ships. And his first ship for the Perkins and Smith firm was a ship named Amaray. Amaray went to the Davis Strait, which you saw from the old map, it'll be up again, um, which is off uh, Baffin Island. That's where the whales go to spawn. You go and you hunt your whales there. And Buddington went and it was a really successful voyage and he comes back. And his contract, he's contracted for two more voyages aboard George Henry. This was the first of those voyages. So in, um, he went to the Davis Strait with Emory in 1854, about the same time that the English fleet was sailing back. Then he came back to New London in 1854, and he went out, um, uh, went out with, uh, Oh, excuse me, 883 Amaray. He comes back to New London, successful voyage, excuse me, goes back out in, um, yeah, he was contracted in 54 and then he goes back out to head out to the Davis Strait. I wanna make sure I get the timeline here. So yeah, cause it comes back in 1855. Yeah. All right, so Buddington leaves um, late in 1854 to go back to the Davis Strait. And this whaling voyage is nowhere near like Amaray. He's not finding whales. He's only finding a few whales. He's uh, becoming um, very frustrated with this because he has uh, a stake in the ship's lay. The more oil he gets, the more money he makes. All right. And he really wants to not have a failed whaling voyage um, because then confidence in him doing another one will probably be not really, he won't have a lot of confidence. They won't have a lot of confidence in him. So, um, it's September 10th and they are off the coast of, um, here, I wanna make sure. They're off the coast of um, Baffin Island and they spot a ship and they give signal to the ship. And, um, They get no answer. So Biden navigates the ice flow to get close enough to offload some men and some sledges to get to that ship and find out what's going on. So they use ice rafts, which is actually like you've seen polar bears standing on pieces of ice. That's what they did. They would stand on ice and they would navigate that through there. They would do sledges. It took the men three days to actually get to the ship. And they got on board and they found the Resolute just the way she was left. Okay, they saw the, the, the food was out, the, the wines were out, the brandies were out. They just got up and left. The, the guys, there was three men, they would talk about putting on officers' uniforms. They toasted, um, uh, the, because there's brandy in their sailors, um, 
they toasted the absence of the crew. They toasted, you know, how they abandoned the ship. They learned that, that they abandoned the ship. And eventually they signaled to Buddington that um, this is the Resolute. Now the slide we're looking at, I really want to talk a moment about this. Um, when the ice broke up, Resolute drifts 1,100 miles southeast. The Arctic current pushes her there and she gets in the, trapped in the flow off of Baffin Island. And that's where Buddington found her. So Buddington needs to come up with a plan. He's had a failing mission so far. He knows that if he can salvage Resolute, Resolute's gonna be worth a bit of money. And as such, he can turn this failing whaling voyage into a successful salvage voyage. So he's got 26 men on the ship, including his son, Sidney. He divides the crew in half. And he takes with him his son, he takes um, a sailmaker and he takes the ship's carpenter. And the first mate on the George Henry is a man named John O'Malley. And John O'Malley has never really been, um, never captained a ship before. He was very young. Buddington was concerned that this young man couldn't get Resolute back to New London. So he decides to take command himself. And when he does that, um, he, that's a kind of a, a, a mistake, but not necessarily a mistake. He brings his men aboard, but it was a decision that would haunt him later. He brings the men aboard and they outfit the ship. It takes them a week and that's it, a week. And he agrees that he and George Henry would sail back together. He gets to where George Henry is supposed to be, but it's not there. He waits Oh, he waits, um, was it three days? He waits three days for O'Malley and he doesn't find him. So he decides he's gonna sail him. He's gonna sail back now. I'm gonna sail back. And he heads back to um, New London. So Resolute arrives on Christmas Eve. Some of the newspapers have reported the 23rd. Buddington said, I got there Christmas Eve, um, December 24th of 1854 excuse me, 1855, anyways, um, 1855. So he gets back, he's there, okay? And um, lots of fanfare. And the, actually the harbor right out there, I'm pointing the wrong way, right out there, um, it freezes. When Resolute comes back, it freezes. And Buddington said, it's the Resolute. The Resolute brought the Arctic wind with it and it froze the harbor. So um, lots of fanfare, everybody very excited that the Resolute's here. They have even a reception on board. They have a New Year's party on board the Resolute. So a lot of people are very excited, including Buddington, because he's now, again, turned a successful, uh, turned this into a successful salvage mission. So the only issue was, we have a dilemma. Of the men who were in charge of this uh, ship, the George Henry, the Perkins and Smith firm, only one man was actually there. Elias Perkins was out on the island of Maui at La Haina and his house there. They had, he was overseeing the Pacific interests there. And Franklin Smith decided because the panic of 57 was coming up and he was losing some money, he decided to come out of retirement. And he took command of the uh, whale ship Lawrence and he sailed to Desolation Island to Elephant Seal uh, later as the whaling industry started to wane. Um, they were looking for other oils and they decided Elephant Seals were a good idea. Um, and actually Frank Smith was coming back on the Lawrence and his hold was filled with elephant oil. Um, when he was getting back here, but he was gone. It left uh, Nathaniel Shaw Perkins Jr. It left Shaw to deal with it himself. Now, the problem was, the dilemma for Shaw was, who owned the Resolute? You had to get the British to release the rights of the Resolute to whoever salvaged it, so it wouldn't complicate things. Well, British law says the captain of the ship that finds the salvage owns the salvage. American law says the owners of the ship that finds the salvage owns the salvage. Here's the problem. Oh, that happened. We'll try this again. So Shaw writes the um, British ambassador in Washington. His name is Sir John Crompton. He said, who owns the right? I need you to relinquish the rights to Resolute. So um, Crompton said, I'm going to leave it to the Admiralty. And the Admiralty said, Buddington owns it. Okay, 
Shaw became concerned and he got a little nervous about this. So he ended up writing a man named Henry Clifford, who was a lawyer in New Bedford. And um, he wanted to get some advice as to what uh, John, John Clifford, a lawyer in New London, a lawyer in New Bedford, he wanted to get some advice. How am I going to get the rights to um, Resolute? So Clifford gave him a number of strategies. We actually have a letter here in the society's number, and I'm not going to go into them. At the end of all of these, these conversations back and forth, Shaw gets a hold of Henry Grinnell. Now, how does Shaw know Henry Grinnell? This is Henry Grinnell from before. We know about Henry. Henry Grinnell knows, um, uh, Shaw knows Henry Grinnell because Moses Grinnell, Henry's brother, and Robert Brown Minter and his partner and brother-in-law have invested in the George Henry. So they're investors. And if George Henry and the Perkins and Smith's um, company owns the salvage rights when Resolute is sold, they get a, shares of that money. So Grinnell gets involved and Crampton endorses Grinnell and they secure the rights for the owners of the George Henry. That's how it's written, the owners of the George Henry. So now they have it and they can dispose of it. Meanwhile, um, a man named Safton, uh, Edward Safton writes Shaw and says, He's from Boston. He's the consul in Boston, the British consul in Boston. He wants to know about the stuff that's on board because he says a lot of the mariners have gotten hold of him and they want their stuff back. And he said, these things will only have any value to anybody who owned them before. No response back. I do know we have a number of things in our collection and here they are. Dibden Songs was in the library, the wardroom chair, and Tom, and, and excuse me, Henry Kellett's tea bowl. We have that. They're all on display down in our exhibit room. When we're opened up, if you want to come and see them, please feel free to come by. So Henry Grinnell decides, I've got an idea. He gets a hold of Washington and says, listen, why don't you, government, United States, buy it, fix her, and give her back to England as a goodwill gesture. Senator Lafayette Foster, Lafayette Foster was from Norwich. Um, he uh, uh, becomes the mayor of Nor Norwich. He is, uh, the, uh, he is a lawyer. He's the first president of the New London County Historical Society. He was pro president pro tempore of the Senate. At this point in time, right now, when this is happening, he's a senator. And he becomes involved. Okay, Grinnell had written to the Secretary of the State. Foster heard about it, and he liked the idea. So on June 10th, he took it up with the Commerce Committee in the Senate to kind of investigate this idea. He didn't put forth any legislation because he didn't think that the South would agree with this idea, okay? So why, why did Grinnell do this? Grinnell did this because the relationship between Britain and the United States wasn't the best. And there were a number of reasons for this. After the American Revolution, um, the Americans were given everything east of the Mississippi um, and Britain was still trying to colonize things. So there were border disputes along Maine and New Brunswick, the Oregon country, there were border disputes up there. Um, when the Mexican-American War happened and um, uh, because of uh, America annexing Texas, the British tried to get the Mexicans not to attack the United States. They ignored him. They attacked it and uh, attacked the United States and America ended up with, the uh, United States ended up with Canada. The British actually um, provided munitions to the indigenous peoples uh, in the United States to act as a buffer zone between the East and the West. So they were really there. And then on top of it, we have the War of 1812. They blockaded France because of Napoleon. The United States can't um, trade with France. Then there was the impressment of American sailors. So you have all of this going on and all of these contentious issues here. So relationships weren't the best and Grinnell and Foster thought that this would actually work. So Senator James Mason of Virginia agreed with Foster and the two of them authored a bill and they put it forth on June 24th of 1856. It was Senate bill number 22 it was a joint resolution calling for the purchase and refit of HMS Resolute. And furthermore, Resolute was to be gifted back to England. Congress passed the resolution unanimously. And they bought Resolute for $40,000. Resolute was then taken to New York, where she was restored, stem to stern. 
identical to the way she was before she left. And then on November 12th in 1856, the Resolute got underway and they sailed from New York to Portsmouth, England. And she arrived home on December 12th of 1856 to great fanfare. Queen Victoria herself made a point of going to the ship. She stood on board and said, thank you for returning to us our ship. And they were absolutely right. This did improve relationship, uh, the relationship between England and the United States. So in 1879, Victoria decommissions Resolute. She was acted as a museum ship, a lot like USS Constitution. I served aboard or the HMS Victory. And when she was broken up, they gave, um, Victoria had three desks made. Okay, and we're, we'll see, and I've got the Perkins, I've got the Henry Haven flag up there on the, on the um, slide. Underneath that is a small writing table. All of them have a plaque on it saying they're the Resolute Desk. The writing table Queen Victoria kept for herself. It's on the um, Victoria and Albert, it's a royal yacht. Below that is the uh, Grinnell Desk, and it was gifted to Henry Grinnell's wife um, for his efforts and um, thanking him for everything that he had done. That desk was at Mystic, it's back in New Bedford, the New Bedford Whaling Museum. The Grinnell Papers and the Grinnell Collection is at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. The other is the desk you see up in the corner there. I showed you two pictures because originally she didn't have the panel in front of her. It's a partner's desk. So partners would sit on either side of the desk. That panel was installed later on. Um, that panel was installed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, everybody thinks JFK because they saw a picture of John John underneath with it open. Um, but Roosevelt didn't want anybody to see his legs. And that's how the United States got the Resolute Desk. So I'm going to stop sharing here. And I'm going to see if there's actually any questions. Okay, so um, the Erebus and Terror, where I asked where was the Erebus and Terror found, um, let me get back to this. The Erebus and Terror, they actually were found and that was on the map here, hold on a minute. I'm trying to get back to that map. Here we go. Sorry, I'm going to show you actually where they were found. I just need to get back to the map that I keep showing. There it is. So you see the three blue dots. Um, era Terra was uh, um, found um, off of Beachy Island. You see that second blue dot underneath um, um, Devon Island. They found her there. Um, excuse me, Erebus was, uh, Erebus was found there where Franklin left her. Um, they found her there in 2016. Um, and Terror, if you follow that red line all the way down to the bottom, the little blue dot there, um, and then there's one underneath there, it says King Williams Island. The Terror, where that little blue dot, the red line ends at that blue dot, that was the last time they heard of her. Um, part of her was found, uh, right, uh, the majority of her was found at uh, King Williams Island. Um, she had sunk in the harbor of King Williams Island. I imagine she was abandoned as well. Um, but they found both of them. That was 2018 when they found her. So, okay. D uh, did the John Hen the George Henry? Um, did the George Henry return? The John Henry? Did the John Henry? John Henry? I'm assuming you mean George Henry. The George Henry not only returned to um, New London. I'm sorry. It took O'Malley. Um, uh, she got there five days early. Um, so, and what happened was the rudder was ripped off of George Henry and actually had to replace her. They, ju they jury rigged her. Um, and um, she lost that rudder twice more. It took them, they took, they had three rudders and then he got, O'Malley got her back five days early. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And, and then of the $40,000, um, I'm going to answer the other question, but I, I do want to touch on this. Uh, Perkins and Smith didn't get any of that money. Um, the Panic of 57 forced them to sell all their assets, uh, including their whale ships. And Henry Haven, um, those are people who are from New London know Henry Haven, he ended up buying all of them. And because he was an, the owner of the George Henry, he got that $40,000. And he didn't give it to anybody. He kept it. 
And um, Buddington got really angry and actually took Haven to court to get his share of the prize money. And he lost and won. He won in that the crew got their shares, but he didn't get any of his. And what Haven said was because Buddington didn't sail George Henry back, he sailed um, uh, Resolute back, that he abandoned his command and broke his contract. And the court agreed with him. Um, so Buddington didn't get any of that money. And he was really, really angry about it for the rest of his life. Um, he did get paid for the second cruise of the George Henry he was supposed to get, but he never went out on. He even had to pay him for that contract, but he didn't get any salvage money. Um, in fact, he was so angry at one point he wrote in a journal that he'd pulled a knife on uh, Haven. Um, I like to think that that's true. Um, Nixon didn't use the desk. Nixon took it down uh, out of the Oval Office and he used his own desk. Kennedy brought it back up. So every president with the exception of Nixon used it. So, um, okay, uh, thank you all. If you don't have any other questions, I wanna, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, thank you all for uh, the, attending and I'll give it back to Amy. Thanks, Steve. Um, and thanks for taking us on that wonderful adventure. It was quite fun. Um, so I wanna thank you all for joining us and uh, for your support, for your questions. Um, just a couple things. We will um, be hoping to have another virtual stories of the park um, queued up soon, keep posted. And lastly, a friendly reminder, although water taxi season doesn't start until Memorial Day weekend, you can always buy season passes um, and tickets on our website at thamesriverheritagepark.org as well as make donations. So we hope we'll see you again soon at our next stories from the park and so long.